So in this video, I want to completely change your approach as to how you manage piriformis syndrome, otherwise known as sciatica. So this common presentation that we find in our patients is something that we deal with a lot in the physical therapy world. However, what I find is that when there's a common presentation, it tends to come with common interventions. And although the interventions are backed with the intent of hoping to improve those symptoms for the patient, it tends to not be specific enough. So what I wanna do is really break down why the patient has those symptoms and where they're coming from. In other words, what is the source? Instead of just treating the symptoms that they, the patient, are telling you, I want you to understand biomechanically what's happening at the pelvis because of their presentation. So we're gonna jump into why and where it's coming from to better understand the source. And then I wanna go over three easy strategies that you can start to implement to help the specific problems with your patient. Before we can jump into our interventions, we need to take a step back. We need to understand the basic anatomy and biomechanics of the pelvis. Now, most physical therapists, when they address sciatica or piriformis syndrome, they tend to move and treat in a symptoms-based approach. Now, this may give your patient short-term relief, but ultimately, it usually fails long-term. So when you start to understand the significance of the biomechanics and the anatomy, you can start to treat and fix the source. Once you are doing this, you're not just getting the short-term relief that they're looking for, you're ultimately giving and providing them the long-term solution. So with that being said, let's bring out our pelvis and start to break this down. So when we start looking at the pelvis and thinking about the pelvis for a patient with piriformis syndrome, we need to first remove piriformis, all right? When you start labeling things, it creates a lot of tunnel vision. The problem with tunnel vision is that you tend to miss a lot of other parts of the puzzle. So this is a very compressed, condensed area that has a lot of tissue in it. The glute max is a massive muscle. We have the piriformis, we have the gemellae external rotators, right? So there's a lot of things in here. It's probably more of a multifactorial reason that your patient has the symptoms that they have. So. First, let's remove the name, remove the label, so we can start to see the person as a whole picture and see how they move and not just get focused on one tissue, all right? So here's the thing. A lot of us are aware that the piriformis, the glute max, the gemelle, they, all these muscles externally rotate. A lot of us do a really good job at envisioning and can picture that and see it with our patient, what external rotation looks like. Right, We see this external rotation that typically happens at the femur and the pelvis. Now, a lot of us stop there. What I want you to do is to go one step deeper, think a little bit more three-dimensionally, and understand that with the external rotation comes compression. Now, compression is going to decrease space. This is the ultimate reason why the patient is actually in your office. They have a space issue from excessive compression. Now, what does that look like? Well, all these muscles here, if you can think my hand representing the muscles, it's going to compress. That compression is typically going to result in the sacrum moving posteriorly. And again, as it pushes and comes into that compression, you fall into this external rotation motion or external rotation from that compression, all right? So that's what's going on biomechanically. So now that we understand what's going on at the pelvis and really this posterior lower pelvis, let's start to look at the two main reasons why this happens to your patient. To better understand how to approach this, I want to break it down into a hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy, I want you to think compression, okay? So compression is the main and root problem. For one reason or another, your patient doesn't have enough space. The tissues are compressing on the nerve, things are getting pushed, and they're experiencing the symptoms that they have told you. So we have compression at the top. As we start to come down, 
there's two main subcategories. The first subcategory is going to be posture related. This posture is more of a decrease in a lumbar lordosis from an associated posterior pelvic tilt. Now, if we move to the other side, the other side or the second subcategory is still posture related, but very pattern driven. This is an orientation issue, specifically an anterior orientation. Now, what is an anterior orientation? Well, I'm specifically saying orientation because we can break down orientation and tilt. An anterior pelvic tilt, a lot of us are familiar with, that's where we're going to increase the lumbar lordosis. We're gonna go into more extension, right? And typically, the sacrum is going to move anteriorly, right? An anterior orientation is a very pattern-driven problem that we have a person here that essentially has dumped the whole pelvis forward. And this could be for a lot of different reasons, but that pelvis comes forward, and one way that they can get back to an upright position, because ultimately we know the body's not going to stay in this hunch position and essentially fall forward, it's going to do everything it can to try to orient itself back upright. If you're here, what's an easy way to do that? That is going to be compression of the posterior lower pelvis that's going to orient that into an upright position. All right, so let's start with the first subcategory, a posterior pelvic tilt or posture. Now, what do we typically see? We typically will see a rounding of the thoracic spine, we'll see a decrease in the lumbar lordosis, and we see the tucking or that posterior tilt of the pelvis. I like to really call this the no butt syndrome. These are the patients that walk into your office and it, they give the illusion that they don't have a butt. This occurs because they get so much of that posterior tilt that the glutes actually kind of round underneath them. Now, here's the thing, biomechanically, you actually know how this is because really this is what we explained earlier in the video. In order to be in more of a posterior pelvic tilt, you're going to have a natural bias of compression in this posterior lower pelvis. Now, in the Performance Redefined course, we talk about narrow and wide ISAs. This would be more synonymous with a narrow ISA. So as a result, we have compression, we have the sacrum that moves posteriorly, we have the innominate bones that move into more of an externally rotated position. Now, with that being said, you can see how that compression is going to push where that sciatic nerve would be. That's where we start to run into the problems. So to address this and to fix this, we need more expansion, right? So expansion or eccentric orientation of tissues here is going to start to get relief and create space for those nerves to run freely without the excess compression. So expansion is going to be the name of the game to fix more of the posterior pelvic tilt problem. So now let's go back to the other subcategory and think about our anterior orientation. Now here's the thing, this could be on a wide or a narrow. This is a very pattern driven problem. That is a dumping forward to get stability, to get internal rotation. There could be a lot of different reasons, but here's the thing. They're still going to have the compression like we talked about. So to get upright, we get into more of a compressed position here, that posterior lower pelvis that ultimately will then start to create problems in sciatica type symptoms. Now, although the problem is the same, these individuals may need one extra step. They may need to work on truly getting back the right way because they are getting back in a compensatory manner. So they may need strategies that ultimately reorients them so that they can get back before we then start to get some expansion here. So yes, they definitely still need expansion, but they may need strategies to start to weight shift back before we then go into that. So hopefully you feel more confident thinking about this type of piriformis syndrome or sciatic symptoms and go back to your hierarchy, right? Compression, below that we have one subcategory that's going to be more of our posterior pelvic tilt. The other subcategory, we have more of our anterior orientation as it relates to our intervention. 
I want to give you three simple activities that are very low risk, high reward. Now, especially with nerve related stuff, but really any patient, you should always be judging risk versus reward. In some instances, it may be beneficial to do a high risk, high reward move. In other times, it might be better to do a low risk, high reward. Now, again, with nerve stuff, it can be very, very irritable. So what we're going to do and what I want to do is give you three strategies that are very low risk, high reward. And ultimately what it's going to do is stretch the tissue. However, it doesn't actually look like you're stretching. The typical protocol that a lot of people go to is a piriformis stretch because the piriformis is labeled tight. Well, what it comes down to is that we don't again need to stretch the muscle. It's already in a tightened position, right? This compression that we already talked about, that's a tight muscle. So as we alluded to, we need to work on expansion exercises. So although this doesn't look like a stretch, these three exercises will give your patient the best stretch that they've probably ever felt because we're increasing space and ultimately moving a concentric muscle towards more of an eccentric muscle. Now, how do we do that? Well, if we turn our pelvis around, what you're gonna notice is these three strategies all involve shifting because if the left piriformis is the problem, if we're in more of this compressed state, the space between the sacrum and the anominate are going to be very close, right? When you start incorporating shifting exercises, if the left is the problem, as I shift back towards the left, you see how this sacrum is getting further from that anominate bone? That's going to be the expansion that we are wanting and looking for. So that muscle is eccentrically orienting. So we're not sitting here stretching the femur and working on the femur, but we're actually orienting the pelvis in a different way that's starting to potentially address the orientation issue that we talked about, but also address the secondary effects that our patients will have being in these poor postures. So again, shifting activities are a great exercise to improve expansive capabilities. Now, the last thing is, is there's one exercise that is in a 90-90 position. Here's the thing, as our body works, when we're in a 90-90 position, we actually have more of a reorientation of an internal rotation component, right? So if you start to look at the biomechanics from around 60 to 90, as we go into hip flexion, we actually reorient back to internal rotation. That again is going to give a nice stretch, a nice expansion in this overly compressed area. So with that being said, let's jump into the three strategies as to how we can start to move away from treating symptoms and fix the true source. A great starting position is a sideline position. Typically this is dictated by your structure, but for this video purpose, we will start here. So you wanna be in a sideline position with your feet neutral and your knees neutral. So we did that with a foam roller and a ball. Then find a slight tuck, making sure you're not in an anterior pelvic tilt and you're gently going to draw the ball back on the left side. This would be the symptomatic side. And then you're repeating. So when you do this, you wanna ensure that you maintain your tuck. That way you're getting that true expansion that you're looking for to increase space. So the second position is a 90-90 position with a ball placed between the knees. Instruct your patient to come out of their anterior pelvic tilt and to avoid an excessive posterior pelvic tilt. So we're essentially looking for a slight tuck. Next, instruct a slight amount of heel pressure down to engage the hamstrings and then utilize the ball to reach the right knee towards the ceiling and the left knee back. The side that's moving back should be the symptomatic side as this is where the expansion will occur. So this would be the hardest of the three, but essentially the same mechanics as the first exercise I showed you. What we're doing is a split stance deadlift, setting up with a toes elevated position. This will help to increase our hinge. What we're doing is we are drawing back on the left, still using the same ball to help drive those mechanics. 
reaching with a kettlebell again to help accentuate that pushback on the left. All of, of this is helping to achieve the eccentric orientation we are looking for or increasing the amount of space in that posterior lower pelvis.